Hello, this presentation will focus on talent management. We were discussing the following, the definition of talent, how talent advances, global talent management and links to identity work. We will also be linking our own experiences throughout. This is a brief overview of what we will be focusing on. Firstly, we will look into common definitions of talent. Secondly, we will cover what we have found when reading about talent management. Thirdly, we will look into research on talent advancement. We will then penultimately look into global talent management. And finally, we will answer questions around the topic. To be effective in analysing talent management, we first need to understand the definition of talent itself. Ross 2013 begins with the dictionary definition of talent, where it is defined as a special natural ability or aptitude, or an above average ability. Lewis and Hackman 2006 also identifies how difficult it is to define talent and that there is very little research into those who are talented. It has become apparent through our research that there is not one single definition for talent and as Capelli 2008 recognises, a recent reduction in talent has become a major concern for HR departments globally. Gallardo and Gallardo 2012 concluded that there are two different approaches when it comes to defining talent. Firstly, there is the subject approach. This views talent as people, where management make the decision of who is talented. Secondly, there is the object approach. This allows for people to develop and better their talent over time. Therefore, talented individuals can have the opportunity to develop themselves and achieve a high performance. The object approach has been demonstrated by us all as group members by embarking on a university degree. Among other decisions, choosing to come to university was a way to better ourselves and develop our talent through our chosen degree. Our view of social construction is that now individuals can only become talented by entering into higher education and there is a constant pressure to achieve high grades once at university or it can be considered a waste of time and money. As a group we also believe that we have not only developed our talent via education but we have also learnt other skills which can be considered talent through our experience at university such as teamwork, timekeeping, communication and working to a deadline. This can be linked to Tarek and Shula's 2010 view on basic competences and talent. However, although we are entering into what experts consider the easiest job market for the foreseeable future, we are all still struggling to find appropriate graduate jobs. Is this because we are in fact not talented? Do we not align with an organisation's view of talent? Or is there a talent surplus? This conflicts with Capelli's 2008 view of a talent shortage, which we will discuss in more detail later in the presentation when we look into talent advancement. I will now pass on to Nick to talk about talent management. The need for talented human capital has continued to rise due to global competition becoming more intense, although as already discussed there is still confusion over what exactly talent is. This makes it very difficult to find a global blanket view on how to manage talent. Tarek and Schuller's 2010 work on what talent management entails is agreed upon, however. This is where it is to attract, select, develop and then retain the best employees in the best roles for the organisation. This is then summed up by Thinison's 2013 work, who wrote how it is simply getting the right people in the right place at the right time. Talent is simply the input to create successful output, which may be higher profits or simply gaining competitive advantage. Different people have different views on what the most important stages are in the talent management process. Capelli 2008 believes that the most important stage is the development stage. However, due to the growing globalisation phenomenon and increased migration, Growing development talent is becoming increasingly difficult. The growing young population has caused an influx in talent. This has caused the assumption that talent management has always worked on of talent shortage to completely change. The massive economic downturn that the world faced caused many people to lose their jobs. This immediately created a talent surplus. There are now far too many qualified people who are just chasing too little jobs. For Lewis and Hackman, 2006, the focus should be on retention. In fact, it should be a priority. If an employee is truly irreplaceable, then what they bring to the company is hugely important. This is where senior management should be expected to step in and guide the talent. Thus, the talent will become managed. For some personal experience of talent management, I'll be looking at a previous job that I had where I was a barman in a regional chain. This job was very standardised, but I was motivated as I wanted to earn money and I was pleased to be employed in my first job. When I began I had little if not no skill in the area of bartending. 
However, I developed into the role and became more and more skilled. The company I worked for therefore had succeeded in attracting, selecting and developing me into a skilled barman to fit the job I was doing. However, due to my age, I chose to migrate my talent and begin my studies at Kiel University. This moved me over three hours away from the workplace, therefore the company was unable to retain my services. Now I wouldn't say I was irreplaceable, but does this suggest that their talent management was flawed? My personal experience in this case seems to suggest that talent management purely depends on the type of employment. It may be possible that in more menial jobs, talent management is less important. However, if the senior management had a greater say in my career, would I have continued to work there? This is also very unlikely. I know that I was immediately replaced and this is down to the surplus of talent and youth available in my generation. I will now pass on to Sean who will be talking to you about talent advancement. As Nick established, talent management comprises of strategies and protocols for the systematic attraction, identification, retention and development of individuals with high potential. Tainsley and Sempic 2008. Although according to Hung and Tainsley 2012, little literature on the topic focuses on the individual's experiences of those who are considered talent and what they go through. Tansley and Tizel 2013 therefore decided to incorporate identity into talent management research by linking the anthropological notion to rites of passage. They used the rites of passage as an analytical framework to understand identity work at various stages throughout the talent management process. The rites of passage originates from Van Knup's 1960 study of social groups where research was conducted into how individuals move from one group to another, for example, from a boy to a man. Rites of passage within talent management conveys a successful transition through a talent management process run by an organisation. This transition is necessary for talent to advance. So far we have discussed talent at an individual level, but McKellar 2010 also states that talent is assessed and managed as a collective level, known as talent pools. By managing talent in such pools, it provides a collective experience for those involved who all bear particular characteristics set and desired by the organisation. Within such pools, talent is labelled as the organisation provides them with an identity. Entry level or rising star, Tansley et al. 2007, are examples provided. It is between these pools that talent has the opportunity to transfer and advance. Talent advancement is based on the rites of passage notion. With the addition of Turner's 1977, three stages of the rites of passage. Turner noted the first stage to be separation. This refers to a person's symbolic or physical detachment from their usual social life or status. Within our group, we have all experienced this first stage of separation. We have all travelled and moved away to study at university. We made this decision in order to better ourselves and improve our chances of becoming talent. Not only have we moved away physically, but we have moved away from our social comfort zones in order to develop symbolically to increase our chances of becoming talent. Turner recognised the second phase to be liminality, consisting of a state where an individual is neither in the first nor the third stage. Individuals are free but lost as they've been removed from the social surroundings that they previously knew and have not yet arrived at their next stage. Newell et al. 2008 noted that the stage holds such characteristics as temporality, ambiguity, freedom to act and being part of a community, communitas. During the summer of 2014, I worked as an intern at Barrett Homes and whilst there, I believe I experienced identity work and also a state of liminality. When I began working as an intern, it was the first real 9 to 5 job I had ever had, as previously I had only ever worked as a waitress and childminder. Initially, it was a shock fitting into a new working environment. I adapted to the way the team around me worked and followed a similar work ethic as them. As many of the team around me worked very hard, they often worked through their lunch hour. As I strived to fit in, I also worked through my lunch as I wanted to be viewed as an equal and hard-working individual. 
Due to this, I gained more trust from the team and therefore more freedom. And alongside that, I was also given more responsibility. I found that throughout my time within a new company, I naturally changed my identity to mimic those who already worked in the organisation. I dressed similar to the other women in the office and followed the same work ethic in order to be the best I could be. At the end of my internship, I had a review session with the director of the department I had been working under and he commented on how well I had blended into the team and also acknowledged that this is not an easy task, especially in a female dominant environment and this has given me more confidence for when I embark on my career after university. Ibra, Snook and Ramo, 2008, used the liminality stage to research identity work that talent must go through in order to achieve and maintain senior leadership positions. In order to understand the emergence of a new self to achieve leadership development, an individual transforms their values, how they think and their feelings. The final stage is the incorporation stage, where individuals are now fully incorporated symbolically and physically into their new existence within society, although now they are a different person. Watson, 2009, stated that in order for talent to progress to the next stage, they must engage in identity work, continuously redefining values and relationships. This change is needed to ensure that talent realigns with the organisation's demands. Within talent pools, individuals are expected to transform themselves into professionals. This is achieved by taking part in stretch projects, which provides freedom to test themselves. To conclude this section, we have established that the rites of passage and identity work are interlinked. Talent cannot advance to the next talent pool without a degree of identity work occurring. Only recently, I have had in-depth experience with regards to talent pools. As I will be graduating from university in the coming months, I have decided to begin applying for graduate employment schemes. For one application alone, I have made it through four talent pools before arriving at the final stage. Along the way, each stage has tested my ability in different ways, from individual interviews to organisational group work. I believe that these are different forms of stretch projects. The whole process has been extremely stressful, with unrealistic targets being set by talent managers. This form of talent management has in fact had a negative effect on my experience within the company and made me question whether I truly want to work there at all. We will now be discussing global talent management. Malahi and Collins 2010 focus specifically on how talent is managed globally and the effectiveness and failures of where they draw talent from geographically. With this being said, research on global talent management has been made more specific when looking at multinational enterprises who experience a competitive disadvantage due to the failure of talent management. These multinational enterprises can tap into a globally diverse pool of talent, which can allow the organisation to cater to local needs. However, in order to make sense of and manage talents, managers resort to classifying and simplifying individuals, which in turn lead to a failure of talent management. Aston and Morton 2005 point out that there is a lack of a single consistent definition of talent management. However, there are many definitions into why it fails. According to Malahi and Collins 2010, this includes undermining teamwork by focusing on individual performance and reducing motivation by neglecting insiders whilst looking for star talent outside of the organisation. The consequences of talent management failure can be detrimental to an organisation, as Capelli 2008 suggests that when employees fail in their jobs, part of the organisation also fails. Mismatches between supply and demand of talent are also noted as failure to manage, as Capelli 2008 also points out. As of summer 2014, I began working as a marketing intern for a venture capital company in London. This company ran on a multinational level with offices also in Macedonia and Miami. As I began working for the company, I was thrown into a very diverse pool of talent, working alongside French, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, German, Canadian and Macedonian with all different qualifications and experiences. I was the only employee with a British nationality who spoke English as their first language. One of my roles involved working over Skype with the team in Macedonia. From my experience, it was clear that the organisation had tapped into a diverse pool of talent by employing individuals overseas who were technically more competent and who would work for longer hours at a shorter cost than those in London. This was an effective way of gaining competitive advantage as the organisation lower costs and were able to work more efficiently. On the other hand, the use of Skype as a means of communicating and managing the team, along with the language and cultural barrier, created a failure in global talent management. 
This was apparent when the team manager, who was also trying to manage the London office, had to put all of his focus on the graphic designer in Macedonia when she didn't understand what her task or roles were. This led to an undermining of teamwork in the London office, which backs up Malahi and Collins' 2010 suggestion of why global management fails, especially as team members in London began to be blamed for the misunderstandings and miscommunications. More so, failure to manage talent across the globe also became more problematic, due to senior management always seeking for new star talent. A lot of focus in both the Macedonia and London office was on interviews and trials which took place in the office every day. The supply became more than the demand and individuals in the office were left with no space to work in and little work to do. This backs up Capelli 2008 suggestion of mismatching supply and demand. We will now be answering your questions. Do you believe all workers have the potential to be talent? What has your experience been? Yes, we do believe that all workers have the potential to be recognised as talent, although as the definition of talent is difficult to establish. With the appropriate support, education and training, we believe that all have the ability to become talent, although the degree of talent achieved may vary. As we have discussed talent, it is difficult to define and therefore difficult to recognise as different people display different talent areas and observe talent differently. We also need to bear in mind the subjective notion that different cultures view on what is talent. We personally have seen in our university environment the range of backgrounds that everyone came to university from. But yet, we all have this equal opportunity to either become talented or increase our talent, even though from a range of backgrounds. This would support the notion that everyone has the potential to be talent. Do you feel it's more important to align yourself with the organisation's objectives or to develop high levels of skill in your role? Ross emphasises the alignment of employee and organisational goals in his 2013 work. We as a group think that although it is important to obtain a certain degree of qualifications and skills, each organisation looks for completely different objectives. Therefore, it is important to have skills and talent to offer an organisation, but also to be able to adapt them to suit the specific organisational needs. Organisations are more likely to hire those who can, they can mould to suit their company. This is so they can meet the objectives, and this is also why organisations often recruit graduates and keep promotions within the company. In order to maintain their role within the organisations, individuals must alter their individual goals to align with the organisation goals. This can be linked to identity work and how people must change their identity to suit their work identity. Is the talent management process discriminatory? To an extent, we would agree that talent management process is discriminatory. Organisations have their own view on what talent is. So when finding new employees or to place new employees in new jobs, they will have an idea of the talent that they are looking for. Even if it is not the right person for the job, they may gain the job due to having a certain quality over another person. We have found that talent is generally assessed on performance and underlying assumptions that the bosses have in their brain. Personal experience of this is current job hunting for us as new graduates. We are competing not only with people that will be graduating in July, but also with people who graduated last year. The people who graduated last year we looked upon favourably because they already have their degrees set in stone. Although we may come out of university with possibly better degrees or the same degree, we are not viewed as favourably as they are. This is discrimination. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed our presentation.